Again, welcome to this week's office hours for ESG and ESG CV. My name is Siobhan McHale, and I am today's moderator. If you are just joining us, please go to the chat and introduce yourself with your name and the region you represent. As a reminder, this office hour session is being recorded for public record. Office hours recordings are in are on the California ESG CV past trainings webpage. A copy of the slide deck and recording will also be emailed to you. Next slide, please. How to ask a question. All questions must be submitted in the chat box. Please type your organization and question into the chat box. The team will read the questions out loud at the end of the presentation and will provi provide answers, if possible, throughout the presentation. All question and answers entered into the chat box will be recorded as part of the public record. Alongside our presenters, we also have several HCD staff, including ESG CV representatives, ESG CV grant administrators, and other consultants who are able to answer questions during the Q&A session. Next slide, please. Today's office hours session agenda includes the following. ESG, ESG CV updates, office hours update, upcoming trainings, ESG and ESG CV Q&A, and today's spotlight session, homeless prevention requirements and eligibility documentation. Next slide. Here on this slide, you will see we have ESG policy documents. We have the resources and the links, and they will be emailed out in the slide decks. Next slide, please. Please reach out to your ESG representatives listed on this slide if you should have any questions. Next slide, please. And now just a few ESG CV reminders and updates. Reminders for performance milestone. All program funds for projects, street outreach, emergency shelter, rapid rehousing, and homelessness prevention must be expended by September the 30th, 2023. All funds for HMIS and administrative costs shall be expended by October the 31st, 2023. And final request for funds, must be submitted to the department by November the 15th, 2023. Next slide, please. Upcoming office hour topics. On 322, rapid rehousing policy. On 329, housing stability planning. On 405, de-escalation. On 415, emergency shelter policy. Um, policy, emergency policy and shelter inspection reports. You will also see on this line um, future um, office hour sessions and to view past recordings. Next slide, please. Upcoming trainings from March and April, March 16th from 10 to 12, shared housing. April the 4th, 2023 from 11 to 1 p.m., evaluating client eligibility. Next slide, please. On April the 7th, 10 to 12 p.m., low barrier emergency shelter. On April the 11th, from 10 to 12, hiring people with lived experience. Next slide, please. On May the 2nd, from 11 to 1, documentation cost, documenting cost. Um, and on May 10th, 2023, from 12 to 1.30, data-driven decision-making. Next slide, please. At this time, we will hold for any questions. Next slide, please. And how to contact us. If you have any further questions, please contact your annual ESG representative by emailing or emailing um, ESGNOFA at um, hcd.ca.gov or by emailing your grant administrator for ESG CV. Next slide, please. And now I will turn it over to Kristen and Gordon for homelessness prevention requirements and eligibility documentation. All right, thank you very much, Shavana. Um, I will pass it over to Kristen to read us in. 
All right. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Kristen Delcamp, and my pronouns are she and hers, and I am an ESGCV grant administrator. Gordon, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Gordon Levine. My pronouns are he and him. I am white and Jewish, and I am a lead homeless services specialist with ICF. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you. All right. Next slide, please. So today we are going to be focusing on sub recipients and sub sub recipients. So the training is focused on sub recipient ESG implementation. It is most applicable to California HCDs direct sub recipients and to organizations that receive ESG from sub recipients, sometimes called sub sub recipients. Next slide, please. And Gordon, over to you. All right, so let's talk about the basics of ESG homelessness prevention. Next slide, please. So homelessness prevention, uh, according to the ESG program in a rule, is housing relocation and stabilization services and short and or medium term rental assistance necessary to prevent an individual or family from moving into an emergency shelter or another place described in paragraph one of the homeless definition, i.e. literal homelessness. And that's in uh, the ESG program interim rule section 576.103, which was pretty dry. So let's talk about what that actually means. Next slide. All right, so what homelessness prevention is actually for is the cost of providing financial assistance, which includes housing costs, case management, and other services, which includes mediation and legal services, to help a person or family remain housed. The same eligible, it, ha it has the same eligible costs as ESG funded rapid rate housing, identical eligible costs, but they serve completely different populations and they do so in completely different ways. Uh, so let's see. Uh, if everybody could be on mute, thank you. Um, so uh, rapid rehousing, if you're more familiar with that model, if you understand that uh, it does the same things that homelessness prevention does, but for a completely different population of folks, and in a completely different way, you've got a pretty good head start on homelessness prevention. Um, finally, there's a really big gap between what ESG homelessness prevention can do and what it should do, and we're going to spend the bulk of our presentation talking about that later. Next slide, please. Back over to you, Kristen. All right. Thanks, Gordon. All right. Let's go ahead and talk about eligible participants. Next slide, please. So there are three categories that we're going to be looking at in terms of who is eligible for homelessness prevention. They're category two, category four, and the at-risk definition of homelessness. For a refresher, category two, the imminent risk of homelessness is an individual person or family who will imminently lose their primary nighttime residence, provided that the primary nighttime residence will be lost within 14 days of their date of application for assistance and no subsequent residence has been identified and they lack the resources or support networks needed to obtain other permanent housing. Also, they must be at or under 30% AMI. For category four, we're referring to any individual or family who is fleeing or is attempting to flee domestic violence, has no other residence and lacks the support networks to obtain other permanent housing. The definition of domestic violence includes dating violence, sexual assault, stalking, and human trafficking. And keep in mind that those that are fleeing or attempting to flee also need to be at or below 30% AMI. And finally, the at-risk definition of homelessness. And this is an individual or family who lacks the resources or support networks to prevent them from experiencing homelessness and meets at least one of several additional conditions and is at or under 30% AMI. Next slide, please. So let's go ahead and delve into the additional conditions for at risk. When we're talking about that, we mean an individual or family who has moved because of economic reasons two or more times during the 60 days immediately preceding the application for HP assistance, or is living in the home of another because of economic hardship, or has been notified in writing that their right to occupy their current housing or living situation will be terminated within 24 days after the date of application for assistance, or lives in a hotel or motel 
and the cost of that stay is not paid for by charitable organizations or by federal, state, or local government programs for low-income households, or lives in a single-room occupancy or efficiency apartment in which there reside more than two people, or lives in a larger housing unit in which there reside more than 1.5 people per room as defined by the U.S. Census Bureau, or is existing or excuse me, is exiting a publicly funded uh, institution or system of care such as healthcare facility, behavioral health facility, foster care or youth facility or corrections program or institution, or otherwise lives in housing that has characteristics associated with instability and an increased risk of homelessness as defined in California HCD's approved consolidated plan. Next slide, please. So who is actually eligible? So people who meet all of the following criteria, their income is at or below 30% AMI for annual ESG or for ESG CV at or below 50% AMI. They lack another residence or the support to remain housed and they must meet at least one of the following criteria. Either they will experience literal homelessness within 14 days of the application um, or they are fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, or they meet at least one of the at-risk additional criteria. Next slide, please. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Gordon to talk about eligible activities. All right. Thank you, Kristen. Um, and again, uh, this is my favorite piece of clip art. Um, it's just our umbrella for uh, catching all of your eligible activities. Next slide, please. Uh, so our eligible activities for homelessness prevention fall really into two categories, housing relocation and stabilization and short or medium term rental assistance. If this looks familiar and you're familiar with rapid rehousing, that's not a coincidence, they're identical. Next slide, please. Um, so we're not really going to dive in too deeply to what all of this is uh, because it's a lot. And uh, frankly, you can go to the ESG interim rule and look up any of it if you are strongly interested in any piece of it. Um, it's not a great use of anybody's time to do a deep dive. Um, but generally speaking, when we're talking about housing relocation, we're talking about uh, the costs of uh, moving somebody into housing uh, and getting them started up, including, I will highlight, uh, one-time moving costs and emergency transfer costs, emergency transfer costs being a part of how we serve people fleeing domestic violence who need a different unit that is safe, and stabilization, which is focused around uh, getting folks settled into housing or uh, 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 helping folks stay in housing, rather, um, or settling into new housing if their current housing uh, isn't working out. Um, just as a, uh, uh, an appetizer for a subsequent session, um, incidentally, uh, stabilization is where you'll locate the majority of your housing problem solving activities. Um, so prevention and a little bit of diversion, this is where that lives in ESG homelessness prevention. Next slide, please. So special note on rental assistance requirements. This is in bright red because we want you to pay attention to it. Um, it's easy to miss all of this stuff. There are restrictions on when you can provide rental assistance. It has to meet fair market rent standards. It has to meet rent reasonableness standards. It must meet minimum habitability standards. And it must have a written, signed, and legally binding lease. Unless the rental assistance is only for arrears. So if you're only paying for arrears, you don't have to do any of that other stuff. You can just pay the arrears. But that doesn't mean, uh, so if it's just arrears, you don't have to do any of this, but if it's arrears and anything else, so arrears and security deposit or arrears and eh, one-time costs even, you have to do all of it. If it's arrears and ongoing assistance, you have to do all of it. And if it's arrears now, and then they come back a month later and you start doing the rest of it, a month later, you have to do all of this. But if you are just providing arrears and you're doing nothing else, at the point at which you provide arrears, you do not have to do all of this. But the moment you start providing anything other than or in addition to arrears, you have to meet all of these other criteria. Next slide, please. So eligible activities. This is a full list of eligible activities for ESG homelessness prevention products. Um, 
there's a much longer, uh, more descriptive version of this in the ESG general rule, the ESG CD notices, and the CAHCD ESG HP manual, um, which was a lot of acronyms, I know, uh, but it's out there. Um, in general, a household can receive up to 24 months of rental assistance in a 36 month period. Um, there are other forms of assistance that are limited to 24 months um, and they run non-concurrently with rental assistance if they're delivered at different paces. That's very weedsy for this presentation, so we're not gonna get into it. If you keep in your head, as a general rule, Households can only receive 24 months of rental assistance, 36 month period. You're basically good to go. Um, again, not going to go through all of this. A lot of this was added or amended by the ESG CV notice. Um, but basically, what you're looking at is rental application fees, security deposits, utility costs, moving costs, and as needed, emergency transfer costs, including lease breaking fees. Next slide, please. Back over to you, Kristen. All right, thanks, Gordon. Gordon just mentioned the Homelessness Prevention Manual. Let's go ahead and talk about that in a little more, more detail. Next slide, please. The manual has three goals. The first is establishing a structure for new and existing ESG HP projects that enables subrecipients to successfully build projects that are compliant, human-centered, and incorporate best practices from across the country. The second goal is to define the scope of ESG HP projects, including clear information about which ESG CV waivers or flexibilities are allowable and how they affect new and existing activities. And the third goal of the manual is to ensure ESG HP projects are efficient and impactful, meaning they provide tailored assistance to each participant and serve only those who will experience literal homelessness without ESG HP assistance. Next slide, please. The ESG HP manual synthesizes rules requirements and eligible activities from three sources. Those are the ESG program interim rule, ESG CV notice CPD 21-08, and local needs and preferences. Regarding the ESG program interim rule, it establishes the foundation for annual ESG and ESG CV, and is the primary source for the majority of the manual's material. Regarding notice CPD 21-08, it's the most recent document establishing waivers and additional activities to prevent, prepare for, or respond to COVID-19, and local needs and preferences determine which ESG CV waivers or activities are appropriate to implement and ensures ESG HP is spent impactfully. Next slide, please. So there's a need to have uh, written policies and procedures, and we've got a list of them at the bottom here, which we're gonna go through one by one. Next slide, please. The first is participant triage. The PNPs must have a triage process that ensures the project serves only those who will experience literal homelessness without ESG HP assistance. The triage process refers to a method for assessing the entire group of project applicants and creating an order in which the project will serve them. Participants must be ordered in a way that balances two factors. Number one, the project must serve those with the greatest need before it serves those with progressively less need. And number two, the project must serve those who are most likely to achieve and remain in permanent housing before it serves those who are less likely to do so. And it must be aligned with, aligned with the local COC's coordinated entry system. More on that soon here. Next slide, please. Secondly, the suite of services. The PMPs must define each of the following in relation to its suite of services. Number one, the full suite of services that can be provided by the project, which can only include those eligible activities listed in the manual. Number two, the project's process for designing an individualized service plan for each participant that takes into consideration both their housing barriers and their self-sufficiencies. And finally, the project's process for periodically reassessing each participant's service plan and amending it to reflect changes to the participants' barriers and self-sufficiencies. Next slide, please. Okay, staffing pattern. The PMPs must define each of the following in relation to its staffing pattern. 
estimated caseloads for each staff position that provides direct services. These caseloads must be sufficient to meet any commitments or projections made by the project to California HCD. A process for maintaining data in HMIS, including entering and updating participant data in a timely and accurate manner. And projects may define timely manner as they prefer, but are strongly encouraged to adopt policies that require data to be entered as soon as possible, but no more than five business days after it is collected. Next slide, please. In terms of general operations, the policies and procedures must provide sufficient information about the operations of the project that a person not familiar with the project could reasonably reconstruct it from the PNPs. This is, a this is intended to accomplish three goals. Number one, in the event of staff turnover, new staff should be able to read the project PNPs and continue project operations without relying on previous staff for critical information. Number two, external stakeholders, including project monitors, should be able to understand in broad terms how the project operates without relying on staff reports. And finally, the project PNP should serve as a structure and reference point for the project to ensure that implementation matches intention. Next slide, please, and I will turn it back over to Gordon. All right, thank you, Kristen. Um, and I would just highlight from those previous slides, if I can, um, that really all of them kind of aim at that last slide, uh, the policies and procedures and written standards. At the end of the day, if you don't have policies and procedures and written standards as the sort of beating heart of your project and the uh, uh, official record of what you do on sort of a daily or monthly or quarterly basis, um, you know, your project is really only going to live as long or survive as long or prosper as long as the existing staff are exactly where they are. Um, and conversely, any amount of change in your process or any amount of change in your staffing can really destabilize it. And so at the end of the day, uh, you could really boil many of the requirements in the ESG HP manual down to please write it down somewhere and then do what you wrote down. Um, Let's talk about other requirements and best practices. As always, my second favorite piece of clip art. Uh, this is just basketball practice. Next slide, please. So uh, coordinated entry participation. This is a requirement. ESG homelessness prevention is required to use coordinated entry. Um, if this were a classroom setting, I would ask for a show of hands for whose uh, ESG HP projects are actually participating in coordinated entry. None of you would raise your hands. And the reason is most coordinated entry systems don't mention, include, address, take any interest in, or otherwise touch on ESG homelessness prevention, um, because most coordinated entry systems at this time are oriented around uh, a pretty narrow view of what coordinated entry is supposed to do, right? This, this narrow uh, idea of coordinated entry is about identifying people who are good fits for rapid rehousing or permanent supportive housing, and then using the VI SPDAT to assign a score and then getting some folks into housing, but mostly that's that's all we need. So there's no case management, there's no sort of alternative routes to housing. It's just like those two things. Um, and homelessness prevention doesn't really fit that model uh, for a lot of different reasons, most fundamentally because it serves a completely different population. It doesn't make any sense to take a household that's going to experience homelessness within two weeks and put them on a waiting list that statistically is going to take anywhere between 60 to 120 days to spit out uh, a housing result, if it does at all. So what do you do with this requirement that coordinated entry uh, has to incorporate homelessness prevention and the ESG requirement that uh, homelessness prevention has to be incorporated into coordinated entry? Um, there's kind of two answers to it. Uh, the really good answer is you have to set up a one of what really ought to be many parallel tracks through coordinated entry. Coordinated entry is really intended to be uh, this blanket or this uh, one-stop shop or the system where anyone who is anywhere in the sort of I'm experiencing serious housing instability sphere uh, can stop by any of several access points and say, hey, hi, I need something. Can you connect me with whatever I need? Uh, and somebody on the receiving end will assess what you need, figure out where those things live, 
get you connected to them, and then help you navigate the system of resources so that you don't experience homelessness uh, if it's aversible, and you return quickly to safe and stable permanent housing if you do. So you have to build an alternative route through coordinated entry that isn't just like, all right, uh, intake, shelter, waiting list, rapid, PSH, right? That doesn't work for people in homelessness prevention programs um, because they're not experiencing literal homelessness. And here is the here's the secret, honestly, that I think most people don't realize. Most people who are experiencing uh, imminent risk of homelessness do not need ongoing subsidies. And I'm pretending that I'm shouting that for folks in the back because it's such a comprehensive and universal misconception. The reality is that most people who request assistance, what they really need is case management. They do not need an ongoing subsidy. Most people who request homelessness prevention do not experience literal homelessness. Most people who do experience literal homelessness return to housing without a subsidy. And so uh, how should coordinated entry integrate with homelessness prevention? Well, ideally what it's gonna do is work really, really hard to figure out who will definitely experience literal homelessness unless they receive homelessness prevention assistance. And then connect those folks very quickly to homelessness prevention resources and only those homelessness prevention resources that they actually need to exit their imminent risk situation, which in, mo in most cases is case management, but could rapidly escalate from like, okay, a little bit of case management to, okay, now we're doing mediation, to, okay, that didn't work, so now we're doing a one-time payment, to, okay, well, that really didn't work in a tiny number of cases, so we're going to do uh, short-term rental assistance. And all of that is happening in coordination between multiple homelessness prevention providers who are constantly in contact and moving really quickly through what is not a waiting list, right? Like, that just doesn't work if you're going to experience homelessness in under 14 days, that waiting list is going to have a ton of churn, but is instead this sort of ongoing rapid fire case conferencing process. That's the perfect world version. The realistic version in your COC, where there's one homelessness prevention project in like almost every COC on this call, the actual real answer is your coordinated entry policies and procedures on the COC side has one line that says uh, homelessness prevention projects intake, uh, triage, refer, and serve people in accordance with their own policies and procedures. And that's it. That's how you deal with it. Um, the first thing that I said is great if you've got multiple projects and the capacity to deliver some of the highest quality homelessness prevention services in the country. The second thing I said is just fine if you've got only one homelessness prevention project and you don't need to coordinate with anybody else. That's what I got on coordinated entry. We could talk for three hours about it, but that's the uh, that's the short version. Next slide, please. So a best practice, serving the right people. I touched on this before. ESG homelessness prevention's list of eligible participants is different. It's actually like gigantically, wildly different than its list of optimal participants. Like I said, homelessness prevention projects need to work hard to serve only those who will experience homelessness, but for ESG homelessness prevention assistance. And that is a requirement in the HCD manual. And so you need to document how you have determined that a person will experience literal homelessness, but for HP assistance. And the fact that, they might, that they're gonna lose their housing within 14 days, apparently, just on the surface, you know, an eviction notice is not good, right? An eviction, uh, order from a court might well not be good enough, right? Because people who are evicted overwhelmingly do not experience homelessness. Overwhelming, not just like half of them do not. Overwhelmingly, people who uh, are uh, served an eviction order do not experience literal homelessness. They work out a deal to remain in that housing. They find alternative housing. They end up uh, segueing into housing with friends or family. Um, those are all things that just like happen and it requires no homelessness prevention assistance, not even mediation or case management. So IDing those factors that actually contribute in your community to people experiencing literal homelessness, that's part of the task of a homelessness prevention project. This is what's so hard about homelessness prevention is it's so easy to spend homelessness prevention money 
because the qualifying populations are so broad. Like, if you really wanted to, and you had the staffing, you could burn a year's worth of homelessness prevention funding in like three months. It would be so easy to do that. And you would end up preventing almost no episodes of homelessness because it's so easy to put money where it's not actually gonna make a difference. And this is the really hard thing about homelessness prevention projects. ESG is a project to serve people who are experiencing or who will experience homelessness. It's not an eviction prevention program and it's not a low income housing program. I'm a socialist. I wish we were giving everybody money for their housing. I wish rents were hugely subsidized. I wish we were building affordable housing all over the place. And I wish that nobody had to be anywhere in the universe of experience experiencing homelessness. But because ESG is such a limited resource, and because the need is very large, we have to be targeted about the way that we use it. While it's never a waste to give people who are in need money, in my opinion, it is not what this program is intended to do, to just give whoever says they're at risk funds for housing. It is the intent that you do your best to identify people who are genuinely at risk and then provide whatever level of progressive engagement services they need to stay in housing, either the current housing or new housing. That's my big homelessness prevention spiel for the day. Next slide, please. Housing problem solving. You'll note that there are two bullets here and this is like 200 fewer than I wish there were. We're just gonna talk about this in brief today. So housing problem solving is a set of approaches uh, that leverage participant strengths and supports to return to or remain in housing. Homeless, housing problem solving is just like a way too big topic to talk about today, but homelessness prevention projects should lean heavily on case management and mediation because dollar for dollar, they're much more impactful than housing subsidies. At the end of the day, case management and mediation are cheap compared to housing subsidies which is not to say that you shouldn't pay your staff well, you should, but even if you're paying your staff well, which you should be, staff costs are inexpensive compared to ongoing rental subsidies. They're just less expensive. And a little bit of case management and mediation is hugely impactful. I'm just gonna leave you this little teaser on housing problem solving. Early adopter communities report that generally speaking, uh, housing problem solving, prevention, diversion, and rapid exit. You can't fund rapid exit with homelessness prevention, but prevention and diversion. If you've got a comprehensive approach to this in your community, your success rate at returning people to housing or preventing them from exiting housing into homelessness is over 50% with just case management and mediation, usually way over 50%. Some communities in some months hit as high as 80%. That's a giant success rate. No subsidies, talking and sometimes one-time payments. And so looking at homelessness prevention through a lens of like starting low with case management and moving up to mediation, and then like maybe one-time costs and then maybe rental assistance will save money, which is good because then you can spend it on serving more people. And that's the goal is cost efficiency, not in the name of reducing costs, but in the name of serving more people and serving the right people, right being defined here as people who genuinely need this service and who will experience homelessness without it. Next slide, please. Okay. ESG HP needs to be housing oriented. The goal of ESG homelessness prevention is to keep people safely housed. The goal of ESG is to get people safely housed, which means resolving the direct causes of housing loss or homelessness prevention. And that's a surprise, that's a tricky statement. It seems easy, it's not. It seems simple, it's not. It's complicated, it's the other hard part because you have to identify what the actual causes of housing loss are. And the causes of housing loss usually aren't as simple as like, I, I do not have enough money. Like that's sure, definitely, right? But homelessness would still exist if money didn't first. And second, 
the amount of money that a person has on hand or cash flow or any of that is only one component of what leads to homelessness. And lack of funds is only one of the things that, uh, uh, um, I'm going to start that sentence from a different place. Having money is only one of the preventative factors for experiencing homelessness. Money is some of it. Support networks are some of it, right? Alternative housing options are some of it. Um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, the early days of the pandemic, uh, the CDC and other resources were releasing uh, what they called the Swiss cheese model of prevention, where they talked about um, layering mitigation to prevent the likelihood of infection or to reduce odds of infection. So masking was one layer, ventilation was one layer, social distancing was one layer, vaccination was one layer. Um, all of those things are still layers and the pandemic is really outside the scope of what we're talking about here today. But homelessness prevention also uses that Swiss cheese model of prevention. You're mitigating, right? So money is a mitigation factor. Support networks are a mitigation factor. Alternative housing arrangements are mitigation factors. And so identifying the actual causes of housing loss with the family that you are serving, because they're different for each household, and addressing those causes will help you put the right mitigation in front of that household. What you can't do with ESG homelessness prevention, what you can't do is try to fix the person and what you can't do is try to homelessness proof a household. You just can't, you can't do it. It's outside the scope of ESG HP. It's outside the scope of ESG. It's not client centered. It's not cute. It's not person oriented. It's not good practice. It doesn't actually help people. And it doesn't do the thing that ESG is supposed to do, which is get people back to safe, stable, permanent housing, and then let them get on with their lives. Next slide, please. All right, bright red again, important. Progressive engagement. I'm not gonna linger too long on this because I've already talked about it. Progressive engagement in a nutshell means delivering gradually escalating services until the person of the household is safe and stable and permanent housing. Homelessness prevention has a very short timeline, but progressive engagement is still important. In fact, it's even more important. It's just very truncated, right? Um, Case management and mediation are first, one-time payments are next, ongoing subsidies are last. For uh, rapid rehousing or when a person is in shelter, these things are delivered over days or weeks or months even. For homelessness prevention, it's like this morning we're gonna do case management and mediation. And like this afternoon, they didn't work, we're gonna maybe do that again. Tomorrow, one-time payments. Two days out, we might be on to ongoing subsidies. Things happen very rapidly in homelessness prevention. Um, and recognizing that progressive engagement for homelessness prevention means rapidly escalating, but still escalating, is critical to delivering good ESG homelessness prevention services. Next slide, please. Okay, so we talked about this earlier, 24-month um, caps. Participants in ESG are limited to 24 months of 24 months of services and a 30 month period for any combination of services. So several activities have 24 months limits. So stabilization, rental assistance, utility assistance, supportive services, but those limits are specific to each activity, not project type, and they don't need to happen concurrently. Moreover, the caps apply across project types. So it's really 24 months and a 36 month period of rental assistance from any combination of ESG homelessness prevention and rapid rehousing. And the same applies for stabilization and support services and utility assistance, yeah, on and on and on and on and on. And these things don't have to be concurrent. You can do 12 months of supportive services and then 24 months of rental assistance and then another 12 months of supportive services if for some reason those are disconnected. Or you can start with 24 months of supportive services and then 24 months of rental assistance. And you would have 12 months of supportive services and 12 months of rental assistance that don't overlap. This is very, very complicated. Um, at the end of the day, it's easiest just to think of it as in a 24 month period, people can't receive more than, or in a 36 month period, people can't receive more than 24 months of assistance from ESG 
homelessness prevention, and rapid rehousing. Because generally speaking, all of these things run concurrently. It's not always true. I put it out there just so you can keep it in mind in the event you're doing good progressive engagement work, this could get stickier. But the general rule is 24 months of ESG split between homelessness prevention and rapid rehousing and a 36 month period. Next slide, please. On to questions and discussion. I know that that was all a lot. We've got 20, uh, 19 minutes for q and I think Kristen is moderating. We invite you to drop your questions in the chat or come off mute. Kristen, take it away. Great, well, no questions yet. Uh, oh, wait, we've got a question from Ruth Humphrey. She's got her hand up. Ruth, go right on ahead. So just to clarify, um, the 24 and 36 months, if I'm in a, if I'm doing a program from homeless prevention and we're doing maybe a one-time payment, so we do a one-time payment, we do the case management to where we help the client um, become sustainable, but within that 24 months, they have come back, say it's six months later. We have, again, re enrolled them, reassessed the household. We did a one-time payment. Um, we've, we've done resources and things like that to get them, again, back on um, sustainable. And then maybe seven months later, again, they come back for a one-time payment. Does it matter how much we have assisted them within those three-time, one-time payments within that 36 months, or do we just cap it off at the 36 months? Uh, that's an interesting question. So I'm going to try and reframe. I'm going to try and answer it with a little bit of a reframe. And if it doesn't catch your question, I want you to hop back on and let me know that I missed you. Okay. So I think what you're asking is um, really two questions. One of them is, does the amount of money you tuck into those instances, or does the amount of time you tuck into those instances matter? A. And B, does the clock keep running between each of those instances so that you're gonna bump up against 24? Um, the answer to both of those questions is no. So if somebody comes through the door and says, hey, I need this and this and this and this and this, and you give them like the Cadillac of homelessness prevention assistance because that's what they need. Um, and you spend like it's first month's rent and security deposit and arrears and case management and mediation, and you end up spending tons of money on month one, and then they're good for months two and six. And then in month seven, they come back and they're like, well, I need a caddy again. So you give them that same amount of that same amount of assistance and it's thousands of dollars. Then they're good for another six months. They come back in and they need the same thing again. What you've done is you, 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 you delivered three months of services, not 18 months. You did three months of services assuming, by the way, that you entered them into the project that month, and then you exited them from that project that month in HMIS, right? That's how you would track that. That's three months of services, not 18 months of services. And the amount that you spent in a given month is completely irrelevant to that 24-month cap. Um, you, you obviously, you can't, so not obviously, you can't say, okay, um, you're here for one month, so we're gonna pay six months of rent in advance as a single payment. That's six months of rental assistance. Like there's several reasons that's not a good idea. Um, can't, work, can't work it like that, that's six months of assistance. But generally speaking, what you're talking about is you provided three months of assistance over 18 months and the amount of assistance you provided in any given month doesn't affect that 24 month cap. Does that answer your question, Ruth? Yes, thank you. Cool, you are very welcome. Okay, we've got a question in the chat from Holly Motley. Uh, Holly asks, if a client needs assistance paying their arrears only, they don't meet fair market rent and their income is at or below 50% AMI, can we assist them with just the arrears and skip the habitability inspection? That is an interesting question. It has several twists and turns to it. So. Highest level question, is this participant even eligible? So um, under ESG CV, yes, because the eligibility criteria for income is 50% AMI or under. So they're at, at or below 50% ESG CV conservative. Great. For annual ESG, this participant would not be eligible because annual ESG's cap is 30% AMI. ESGCV 50%, annual ESG 30%. Does 
So that's the first thing. Second, if they need assistance paying just arrears, um, can you skip the habitability? First of all, can you just pay arrears? And second, if you do, can you skip the habitability inspection? First, yes, you can absolutely just pay arrears. You do not need to pay prospect. Paying arrears does not obligate you to paying security deposit or utility assistance or prospective rental assistance. You can just pay arrears. And if you do only pay arrears with no other rental assistance, you do not have to do fair market rent, rent reasonableness, Make sure that there's a signed lease, though you should make sure there's a signed lease. You don't have to, but you should. Um, and you do not need to do habitability, though it might be a good idea. Um, and I, I add that it might be a good idea tag on the end of it, not because it's a compliance issue, but because habitability is a pretty light standard. And if you're helping a person remain in housing that does not meet habitability, uh, then you're really not helping the person remain safely and stably housed. Now, you might take their word for it, but that's something to consider about what you write into your policies and procedures. Holly, does that answer your questions? Uh, no. Okay, so Holly's follow-up question there was, uh, so if we use ESGCB, then we don't have to meet FMR. Um, Yes, that is also true, um, though that doesn't have anything to do with only paying arrears. So there's a lot of interlocking parts about things that are waived under ESGCB and things that are waived under if you just pay arrears. If you think about it um, from this perspective, if you're just paying arrears, you don't have to do any of the stuff I just mentioned. You can just pay arrears. And under ESGCB, there's also the FMR waiver, um, though there's not a waiver on rent reasonableness. Um, they operate on two separate tracks of things you don't have to do that happen to intersect in this case. Hopefully that got to your question. Um, follow up if it didn't though. Um, Kristen, do we have any other questions? We do, from Melinda. We're going back to the example with Ruth. So in your example with Ruth, wouldn't the months that you paid in arrearages count? So for example, when they come in, you pay for four months arrears plus the current month. Wouldn't that be a total of five months of assistance? Yes, thank you for catching that. So I did misspeak. Um, arrears do count toward the 24 months of assistance. And so it is 24 months backward or forward. You can't pay 24 months of arrears and then 24 months of pros prospective rental assistance. It's 24 months anywhere in there. Good catch. Thank you for highlighting that. And we have no other questions in the chat right now, but if anyone wants to raise their hand, come off of mute, we'd love to answer more of your questions. Yep, this is your time. <laughs> I like that we had questions right up front, but I, I, I do always get nervous when the questions are just about arrears because it's uh, homelessness prevention is so big and tricky. Um, there's got to be somebody out there who's like rapidly flipping through their project policies and procedures trying to figure out if they're complying or not. And this is a good time to ask. It's a non-judgmental TA space right here. Happy to talk about housing problem solving if that's what y'all folks want to do. We can also end 10 minutes early if that's what you're looking for. I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. Let's just give it another couple of seconds here. People usually take the bait on uh, housing problem solving. I think, may, I think they may be saving it all up for the new and non-traditional session next week. <laughs> Should be a good one. It has, uh, I, will, I will tease that it has the very best, in my opinion, it has the very best three, it incorporates material from the three very best home, or, uh, housing problem solving resources uh, currently published into the body of the presentation. So it, it uh, should be a good one. Should be a good one. Well, I don't see any questions, Kristen. I don't either. Oh, Ruth, oh wait, Ruth, have... Ruth is back. Yay. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> Question. I heard in the beginning of the thing about shared housing, whatever, with CV, because they don't have so many stipulations as regular annual CV. When it comes to the shared housing situation where we can assist somebody doing rapid housing, 
can we provide 12 to 24 months if we have identified one in the CS, the CES um, database, and then we move them into shared housing, but it's not a, a traditional lease, but we're still helping them with their portion of the rent in that shared housing. Okay, that was six questions, which I like. Um, so you're gonna have to stay off mute, Ruth, because I, I have I have some follow ups. So, um, or maybe I'm gonna let, well, let me try and let me try and answer it a little bit. So let's talk about shared housing a little bit. Um, ESG can do shared housing, and in many places in the country, including many parts of California, shared housing is becoming increasingly common as the costs of housing continue to increase and the affordable housing stock and continues to decline. Um, so shared housing is gonna be more and more common. You certainly can do shared housing and subsidize shared housing with ESG. Um, it gets a little tricky when you talk about habitability and if you happen to be listening with your COC hat on, it gets a little tricky with HQS too. Um, there are rules about that in the uh, Housing Choice Voucher or HCV program guideline, also called Section 8, uh, around HQS and shared housing, which is what I would refer you to in terms of figuring out uh, HQS. Habitability's got a lower standard. Um, oh, that's such good news, Kristen. There's a shared housing session tomorrow. Just go to the shared housing session. Um, <laughs> But in the event that you can't make it, um, yes, you can help a household move into a shared housing situation. Yes, in theory, the shared housing situation can have somebody, one person's in there from rapid rehousing, one person's in there from homelessness prevention. Absolutely. Um, if you are just helping the person with arrears, so the person is in shared housing and they're due to lose their housing, you do not technically need to check for a lease if you are just doing arrears and shared housing doesn't impact that. But we encourage you to check for a lease anyway. Leases are important, A. And B, if you were providing prospective rental assistance of any kind, security deposit, ongoing rental assistance, first month's rent, blah, blah, blah. If you're doing any of that, you're still bound, regardless of the fact that it's shared housing, by, by needing to have a signed, written, legally binding lease. Now it can look weird, right? It can be like, a, you know, it, it, it can be weird in all of the ways that shared housing is weird, but it still needs a legally binding lease that establishes the household's right to occupy the premises. Even if it's only a, even if it's like you have the right to occupy the North bedroom and use all of the common facilities. Like that's still a legally binding lease um, or as long as it is still a legally binding lease then it meets the requirement. Does that answer your questions, Ruth? Yes, a little, cause I, I'll give you an example. So we have some um, individuals looking for rental assistance. One of the individuals we had, mm -hmm. he lives, the, the front unit, the front part of the property is a hotel, but the back units he had the, I think the IUDs or whatever, that's they're using for income property, but it's not separate from the hotel unit. Like the all the addresses and everything is same, but the gentleman been living there for 11 years. He came for rental assistance. When I asked him for a lease, he doesn't have a lease. When I asked, you know, call the property, he's like, yes, he rents out the three units in the back as like an actual apartment unit, but yes, the front of the part is a hotel. How can we assist? Because technically it's a hotel. You know, we can't pay rental assistance because it's a hotel. Even though the owner of the, the whole lot, he rents them out as apartments in the back. You know, it's not like a, a weekly thing like the like the um hotel units. And then we have another gentleman where um with the the housing, um, he has a housing voucher. He was able to move into a large, a four bedroom house, but every bedroom is is um, rented by somebody else. So I'm like, how will we go by that? Again, he does not have a lease, but he's able to live there because all four bedrooms is occupied by a different person. And so I'm like, well, we, we wouldn't be able to assist that gentleman because one, he doesn't have a lease. Two, he got to housing with the housing voucher. So how can we assist those two individuals based on HUD standards with the ESG, CV, you know, like the, the ramifications, how can we assist or can we even assist? That's a good question. Um, 
Well, that's pretty far beyond the bounds of really uh, ESG homelessness prevention, but I'm going to try and give the quick answer. We did have another question. I do want to try to hit that one too. In the situation that you're in, here are the ground rules. If it's a hotel, hotel motel room, you can assist with ESG funded emergency shelter dollars if there is no other emergency shelter available. So you can pay for that with emergency shelter dollars, but nothing else. Whether it is, if it is an apartment unit, you can assist a person to move into or remain in it using ESG funded rapid rehousing or homelessness prevention dollars, but you can't and however, those two things cannot be done backwards. Can't use rapid or homelessness prevention to get somebody into a hotel room, and you can't use rapid rehousing, or, or rather you can't use shelter to get somebody into um, permanent housing. That's kind of the, the distinction there. Whether a unit is considered a hotel room, hotel motel room, or uh, a housing unit is complicated, right? Um, generally speaking, though, the controlling question is, is there a lease in place that, a stat that meets the requirements, uh, the state lease law requirements for establishing residency in housing versus the night to night or week to week or conditional rental terms that go along with, uh, with a hotel motel unit? And those boundaries can get pretty blurry. Generally, though, is there a lease attached to this unit, yes or no, is a pretty good guidepost to whether you're gonna assist it using shelter dollars or rapid or homelessness prevention dollars. If it gets too murky though, reach out to your grant administrator and they should be able to set you right. At the end of the day though, um, your best defense is to have it well-documented in the client's file about what you saw and why you did it the way you did it and why that is compliant with the ESG requirements. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I would also encourage y'all uh, who are curious about shared housing to visit the shared housing session tomorrow. Um, there is a, a link to that in the chat. There is also a link to the uh, March 21st housing problem solving session, which as I said, should be pretty good. Uh, so I encourage you to register for both of those. Kristen, I think we've got one more question. Would you like we to pose do. it? Yeah, and this is, I think, a pain point for a lot of people in California. Um, the question comes from Christina Sandoval, and she says, will the FMR increase as time passes? This is challenging for our county. Yeah, so the FMR question is a hard one to answer. Um, without getting into the details of how fair market rents are calculated, established, set, input, blah, 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 which is a long story, the really short version is that FMR is adjusted annually in October by HUD. It's posted for every county and metropolitan service area in the country. Um, and in areas where rent is generally increasing, you generally see an increase in fair market rent rates. That said, um, I'm on a, since we're on a private TA contract, I can say this. Generally speaking, in the areas that are saying our FMR is too low, the increases that you get are not going to be as high as you want them to be, is kind of the, the blunt truth there. Um, and so, you know, I'm not sure in this uh, sort of brief period of time we have, uh, the steps that I would, I'm not sure what I would recommend in terms of advocating for uh, higher fair market rent values, um, but continuing to inform HCD through your grant administrators uh, that this is a pain point for your COC and highlighting the ways in which it's a pain point uh, is one way to raise the visibility of this issue to the folks at the state level. Um, so if it, you know, it's not gonna make you feel any better, but a lot of folks are feeling that exact same pinch and it's not like anybody at any level of government is unaware of that. Which I think takes us to the end of the Q&A and our presentation. Uh, so if we can, uh, I think, just wrap us out and say goodbye for the day. Go ahead, LaQuantia. Thank you, Kristen and Gordon, for such a great presentation. And thank you, everyone, for your questions. As usual, when you exit today's session, a survey question will pop up. Please answer so that we can um, always give you all the feedback and trainings that you all need and sign up for more um, or sign up for future trainings and we will see you next week in office hours. Thank you.